Hello and welcome to today's session on humanitarian engineering at the College of Engineering and Computer Science. My name is Macarena Rojas. I'm the Senior Marketing Recruitment Officer here at the College of Engineering and Computer Science at ANU. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today. And I will also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Today is my absolute pleasure to Welcome, uh, Jeremy Smith. Jeremy Smith is a senior lecturer and reimagined fellow here at the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and he's heavily involved in humanitarian engineering. I would say he's a bit of a pioneer here. Um, we also have Madeline joining us. She's a current student. She's a Bachelor of Engineering, and she's majoring in electronics. And we also have Thomas Larkin, who's an engineering alumni, and he uh, previously studied a Bachelor of Engineering R&D. So um, a little bit of housekeeping. So your microphones have been muted. Uh, this webinar uh, will be recorded. And um, if uh, the way that we're gonna structure our session is that we're gonna have a webinar presentation for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for any questions. If you would like to submit a question, please um, uh, put your questions on the Q&A and we will do our best to reply to them um, as in our first, first serve, first serve basis um, and we will start um, you can put your questions uh, throughout the presentation uh, but once the webinar is done then I will feed those questions to Jeremy Maddie and Thomas to answer them so without further ado Jeremy back to you if you would like to start yep so first of all let me extend my welcome as well to everyone um, from wherever you're calling in uh, it's great to be able to offer a virtual open week uh, in some form as well if obviously we can't visit in person so a bit different for us but hopefully that means that we've still got people in calling in from all over the place so thank you for coming in to attend um as Maka says we'll do a short presentation to start with so i've got a few slides here just to kind of introduce humanitarian engineering as a bit of a concept why we think it's important for engineers and the engineering profession going forward uh, talk specifically about some of the opportunities we have here at ANU and then invite Tom and Maddie to share some of their experiences while they've been studying here at ANU as well. Um, so you can get a sense of what does it look like from a student perspective. So first of all, I'm just going to share um, a few slides. Um, oops. Uh, cool. So yeah, so welcome all. Um, as well. So first of all, just talking about humanitarian engineering, um, it's a relatively new term in Australia, really only becoming widespread just in the last five years. Um, and what we're really looking at is fundamentally how we're using engineering and technology to improve human well-being and quality of life. So there's lots of amazing new technology, lots of amazing new engineering that's being invented all the time. There's examples of engineering that have been used for many years that are really quite, quite powerful as well. And rather how, and how are we using these to kind of really improve quality of life, particularly for what we call marginalized, vulnerable and disadvantaged communities and individuals. Um, so these people who might be subject to certain poverty, might be in high risk or vulnerable areas for natural disasters, um, might have a range of different abilities, different education backgrounds. But how are we making sure that kind of engineering, we can bring that to bear on that very kind of individual level um, to make life effectively better for everyone, not just potentially those who could afford it or those who are in positions of power. Um, we focus on work both in Australia and overseas. So we certainly recognise that um, disadvantage and vulnerability is something that impacts every community around the world. Um, so we work in Australia, we work with a little bit around groups that might be vulnerable to high levels of natural disasters, earthquakes, bushfires, cyclones. Uh, we do quite a lot of work with people with disability as well. So in that case, we might be um, designing new aspects of assistive technology, so tools to help people with their everyday lives. Uh, and then we also do overseas work as well, so particularly in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Um, and we might be looking at that short-term disaster response, but also the kind of long-term, what we call community development. So it's really quite a wide field, um, but has a lot of potential for having real positive impacts on, on people on their day-to-day -day lives. So one area we particularly link to is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you're probably aware of these, but agreed to in 2015. 
and have the overarching aim of eradicating poverty by 2030. So a really significant, complex, but very impactful vision around the sustainable development goals. Looking at 17 areas. Now, engineering isn't specifically one of the goals, but you can see how engineering and technology can really enable and a platform for many of these. So if you look at clean water and sanitation, so obviously treatment facilities, uh, sanitation facilities, there's a lot of engineering that goes in for those. How do we filter water? How do we treat water? How to provide hygiene facilities? And how do we do that in different contexts and for different cultural groups and social groups? Affordable and clean energy, so particularly distributed real energy, renewable energy. So how are we making small scale household solar PV systems available pretty much anywhere around the world? So that, for example, rather than having to rely on car batteries, uh, you can have clean solar PV to charge your phone or to provide some electrical lighting. Uh, industry innovation and infrastructure. So how are we coming up with new and appropriate infrastructure systems that can really enable further development to happen? Um, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and product. So you can see how engineering and technology is kind of underlying many of these goals. And that's really what we're trying to do with humanitarian engineering. It's not about the technology. It's about, well, what impact does that technology have? Is it providing clean water? Is it providing more economic livelihood? Is it providing clean energy? Um, so we're really focused on what's that impact we can have? And then how is engineering and technology working with other disciplines, other sectors, local communities, the individuals to really get to that outcome? So a lot of it is around novel and creative use of engineering and technology. So here at uh, the ANU, we have a number of opportunities to start experience hum humanitarian engineering as you go through your degree program. Um, in first and second year, we have a number of assignment topics and project topics where you can start to explore humanitarian engineering. So what might be some of the challenges that are faced in particular communities or particular regions? Um, so for example, again, around, is there access to clean water? Is there access to secure food? Is there access to appropriate transport? So starting to explore some of those and starting to explore well, what, what role can or does engineering and technology have in those areas? So a bit of an introduction. Um, we've then got uh, a number of overseas partners that we've worked with over five years now, um, where we can provide short-term experiences to really kind of get engaged in the community development side of it and a real opportunity to kind of explore that and embed yourself in that. Now, unfortunately, those international experiences have been on pause this year around COVID, um, but we're starting to bring on some similar kind of intensive experiences where you can work more directly with a community partner or a community to really kind of start to understand what are their aspirations and then how can engineering and technology help to fix that or help to contribute to overcoming that. Um, we have a dedicated course, Engineering for Humanitarian Context. So this is an elective that you could usually take typically in third year, um, depending on your degree program, which starts to explore that a lot more. So really, what are some of the underlying approaches from humanitarian and development work? And how does engineering fit into those to kind of give us a bit of a, a bit of a process and a bit of a framework to help work through these really complex challenges to get to that end positive result? And whether that's health, livelihoods, clean water, renewable energy, that can vary from place to place. And then in your kind of final year, we've got a number of opportunities to undertake either individual or group research and development projects. And these might be one semester or two semesters where you might work quite closely with an individual community partner uh, and work directly with them on a, on a problem or a challenge that they've identified that they need some engineering or technology assistance to overcome. So it's a bit of a kind of a pathway starting in first and second year and exposing you a little bit more so that by the time you get to fourth year, you can work quite closely with a partner um, and come up with some outcomes that might be used. So Tom and Maddie will talk about their experiences of those in a little bit, uh, in a bit more detail. Alongside that, we've also got a number of kind of extracurricular and, and co-curricular opportunities. Um, so we have a local chapter of Engineers Without Borders Australia based in the ACT who do quite a lot of outreach activity. Um, 
we've got what's called the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. So this actually is from the United States of America, but it's a framework that allows you to get recognized for your studies and your extracurricular activities um, for particular grand challenges that the world is facing at the moment. And some of those challenges are around clean water, solar energy, personalized learning, and restoring infrastructure. So it's kind of an extra recognition above and beyond just your degree for doing extra work in these kinds of areas as well. So through these, you can kind of weave together individual pathways based on formal courses and kind of extracurricular activities. But it gives you an opportunity to engage in every year of your degree. To talk through some of the specific examples and projects and partners we're working with. Um, so in terms of those short term immersive experiences, we have about four partners that I think we're working with at the moment um, to, to provide this. And we have projects and funding um, to support projects in Nepal, in the top left, um, in India, uh, in Cambodia, and also we've done a little work in, in, in the Pacific in Samoa as well. So in these situations, we've had students go on typically a two week trip with other students from around Australia uh, and spend two weeks in that country exploring some of the concepts uh, around humanitarian engineering, around development, around engineering, uh, understanding some of the cultural perspectives, some of the history of that country, a little bit of the language, and then usually having a, a four to five day uh, in community experience where you then work in small teams of three or four or five other students to really apply those techniques and start to identify some opportunities where engineering or technology could potentially be used or have an impact. Um, so it's a really good way of engaging with students from around Australia and a community partner. They're heavily facilitated by both engineers and non-engineers. So it's a great way of kind of learning from um, people who've been through those experiences as well. So that's an experience that usually students would do somewhere in the middle of their degree. Um, in terms of those final year research and development projects, again, we've got those in a number of different areas. So we've got a, a long ongoing partnership with a group called Abundant Water, who work in Laos, uh, making ceramic water filters. So these are a classic example of what we call appropriate technology. So they're a mix of clay, which is readily available, and a waste organic material. So in this case, it's used coffee grounds. So grounds that you've, you've filtered your coffee through, you collect the waste ground, coffee grinds, you mix them with clay, you shape them into these pots, you then fire them. The organic material burns out and you go in the clay so it's hard and you're left with a very efficient micro filter that can filter out waterborne bacteria and things like E. coli, which are very prevalent in Laos. So just by using two waste products and some understanding of materials and manufacturing, we can make an appropriate filter that can be made in the local community and provide that kind of clean water. We've had a project going on in Papua New Guinea in the cocoa bean industry. Um, I'm gonna leave Tom and, and Maddie to talk about that because they've both have been and are currently involved in that project. Um, then I say we've also got projects based here in Australia. So one of the examples is a partner based in Sydney who uses 3D scanning and 3D printing technology to make customized 3D printed or theses casts, particularly for children who might have cerebral palsy or similar conditions that affects on their muscle development. In those cases, children are growing very quickly. They need casts maybe every six months or so. Traditionally, they're quite expensive to make, but in this way, you can basically scan a child's leg, convert that to a digital model, and then 3D print a cast at much lower cost that's customized to that child. Um, so it can really aid and, and support their rehabilitation much faster. So we've been looking at ways of how do you make sure those are strong enough, provide enough support for the, for the child, but are still flexible to support their movement. So you can really see what counts as engineering in here can vary dramatically. And that's really what we're looking at. What's the outcome we're trying to achieve and what's the engineering to help us get there. We now also have a formal minor in humanitarian engineering. So this sits along your discipline major. So here at the ANU, you'll do a bachelor of engineering and you'll pick a major. You can now do a minor of humanitarian engineering that sits alongside that. Um, and what that really does is give you an extra set of tools to how do you take that you know, renewable energy or mechatronics or electronics major 
and apply it into complex humanitarian or development situations. So it includes courses from around the ANU. So the ANU has some real strengths in social science, in environment and society, and in Asia and Pacific. So we draw from some of those courses. So an introduction to development, our engineering for a humanitarian context course, which is really where you start to weave the elements together. Uh, a specific context course, so that could be disaster response, domestic development, international development, depending, depending on what your interests are. And then importantly, a multidisciplinary elective course. So working in humanitarian and development work is inherently very multidisciplinary. So you need to be working alongside social scientists, scientists, environmental scientists, uh, policy, business, economics. So you need to be able to work in those teams to effectively come up with the most effective solution that's going to have the biggest impact. So it's really exposing you to that process as well. So this minor um, started last year. And again, it's kind of designed so you can map it over a four to five year program as well. What I might do now to kind of invite Tom first of all and then Maddie just to share some of their experiences in going through this and some of their interest for getting involved and what they were getting involved with. So Tom, if you're happy to, to talk about your experiences. Yeah, definitely. So hey everyone, uh, my name is Tom. I'm a recent graduate of the ANU. I studied engineering, R&D and arts and I'm going to give you sort of a brief overview of my experience with humanitarian engineering over my time at university. Um, so as Jeremy sort of touched on before, there's lots of different pathways you can take with humanitarian engineering at the ANU. And I think I took, uh, in my opinion, a pretty unique and interesting pathway um, that started with a design summit in my fourth year of study. So I took part in an Engineers Without Borders design summit. Um, one of those summits that Jeremy was mentioning before, my program was a two week program in Cambodia. And I say the two weeks looking back and it really opened my eyes up to, I guess, the complexity and the challenges of humanitarian engineering. Um, I think the lasting impression that the design summit made on me and what I think really encouraged me to keep pursuing humanitarian engineering is that I found myself on the design summit having to exercise a lot of skills that I don't think I'd really like tried to cultivate in other courses. So I was really, really challenged to empathize with the clients, with end users of products. I was really challenged to communicate effectively with people. Um, I was really challenged to work in diverse teams. And I think, those skills were eye-opening and challenging. And on this design summit, that's what I think really made me want to continue pursuing humanitarian engineering. So when I returned from the design summit, I was quite eager to see what other opportunities there were to keep pursuing this type of study and this type of research. And I was fortunate enough to then um, start working on this project in Papua New Guinea. Um, the context of the projects, so I'll talk a little bit about sort of my work in the project. And I think Maddie's gonna talk about some of her continuing work with the project. Um, but, uh, so this project sort of been ongoing for the last two and a half years. And when I started on the project, the sort of problem we were facing was that coca bean farmers in Papua New Guinea were drying their products, so drying their coca beans with wood-fired kilns. And the problem with that is that the wood-fired kilns would release smoke taint into the beans, which would lower the value and I guess lower the taste of this sort of fine flavor export cocoa. So I was part of a group of students and researchers when I was working on the project who were looking to design a, an alternative drying mechanism, one that ideally removed the smoke taint without adding too much of an additional cost overhead. Um, and this experience in the project, this sort of first-hand humanitarian engineering individual research project and also group research project, I think really allowed me to keep um, cultivating those skills that I mentioned that I picked up in the design summit. So my skills in leadership, in communication, in solving complex interdisciplinary challenges. Um, over the course of my honors year, I sort of dabbled a bit in the fluid mechanics, the manufacturing, the design, sort of the field work. I got, I got a really good taste of lots of different really critical engineering skills. Um, and I think, yeah, from, a, from the perspective of someone who's now graduated from the ANU, I think that my experiences with humanitarian engineering really, I guess, solidified some of my leadership and my technical and my sort of other really, really important professional skills. Um, and yeah, that's, I guess, my experience of humanitarian engineering. Thanks, Tom. So we should point out these, these pictures are from Tom's visit you had a week or 10 days over there at one point? Yeah, yeah, one week trip. Um, so that's me on the left as I was about three years ago. So 
hopefully not looking too different. Um, but this particular challenge is that if we can solve this issue of the smoke paint, the value of the beans would kind of almost double straight away, even if we didn't change anything else. Um, and most of the beans in Papua New Guinea, or this part of Papua New Guinea, are grown by small households. So it's really they're basically their cash crop. So if we can double the value of that, it's having a big impact on the livelihoods of those individual households and those families as well. Um, Betty, did you want to talk about um, your experiences as well then? Yeah, um, so I think I've had a similar experience in um, humanitarian engineering to Tom, um, but I think my main motivation for even doing engineering was that I wanted to challenge myself and I don't think, you know, um, working in a field with very specific needs and a lot of sort of limiting constraints and sort of challenging conditions, you know, it, humanitarian engineering and working in sort of these areas was just perfect for me and I really quite enjoy it. Um, but I was introduced in through doing the special um, uh, topic in engineering, which was the humanitarian um, engineering course that Jeremy was talking about earlier. And that was sort of the foundation for um, my understanding of humanitarian engineering. And then um, after doing that, I was able to go on a design summit to Nepal. So we went over there and it was again, um, similar sort of frame that Tom um, experienced, framework that Tom experienced, but it was in Nepal. Um, so it was two weeks there. And uh, the course that we did with Jeremy really helped me understand how to sort of empathize with the end user, understand what sort of, um, uh, challenges you might be facing when you're going to be working in the field because it's quite an immersive experience and it's a fantastic sort of professional opportunity to learn and apply those skills. You know, uh, there are many opportunities to practically apply your skills or theoretical opportunities at ANU, but this is a really tangible um, way to practice and test out what you've been learning. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. You know, uh, there are a few photos of me there um, with lots of people that I've met from all around Australia. You could, you know, uh, were able to meet mentors that had fantastic experiences um, and qualifications in really, really interesting subjects. So you're able to build a little bit of a network as well of people that were sort of interested in similar things to you. Um, and at the end of the time there, I was able to do a presentation to the community that we've been um, staying in, um, staying with, and uh, they were able to sort of see how well we'd sort of picked up on their needs and um, from there sort of, yeah, get some validation that we sort of applied our skills correctly. And um, I'm also continuing the project that Tom has been talking about and Jeremy's been talking about um, in Papua New Guinea. And so we're sort of looking at a different way to cool these beans. First, we're looking at biodigesters, which are really cool um, sort of tools that turn waste products into energy. Um, but due to the many different constraints that you find when you're in the fields, we've moved on to looking at heat pipes instead, which are very efficient um, conductors of heat, which we can use to cool the cocoa beans. So it's been a really, really interesting and challenging experience, but I think that it's made me um, a better lateral thinker, more flexible and dynamic when it comes to solving problems. So it's been a very, very, very rewarding um, course and path in my time at ANU. Thanks, Manny. Um, and I'd certainly that's that's the feedback we get from I'd probably say all of our students that being involved in these experiences makes you a better engineer. Period. Um, and we see that as well from graduates when they go out looking for employment that their, their involvement in this demonstrates that ability to work in very different environments, in kind of cross cultural environments, communicate in very different ways. Once you've worked with a translator, that's kind of you know other types of communication is a lot more straightforward. Harrison, um, point out as well that you know Maddie's work on this project is very live. So Maddie's got an email that she's been doing some analysis work based on what the client needs in Papua New Guinea that she'll be sending out in the next couple of days. So you're kind of in many of these projects, you're actively involved in the work that's going on as well. Um, so there's a snapshot of a couple of those projects. Oops. Um, we're really fortunate we've had a lot of graduates being interested in this area um, and some here in terms of some of the work they've done. So Hoy uh, has gone on to do a lot of work around assistive, assistive, technolo assistive technology and working with people with disability. So how do we make 
customized appropriate technology that can then provide someone with better economic opportunity or more social inclusion, allow them to have greater mobility or engage in different ways. So Hoy's done that work here in Australia and also in places like Timor-Leste and in the Solomon Islands. Um, Emily, who's done some work, she did some work with a group in WindAid in South America, um, doing small scale wind um, generators that can generate power remotely. She's now working for Arup, which is a large Australian engineering consulting firm. She's actually invo been involved with us on the PNG project. So they've actually been providing some technical advice to our students. So it's also great to make those connections. Um, but she's also been involved in a project looking at the, the dairy industry in Sri Lanka. Um, and she looked at as well with Arup of how, Arup, how do Arup take the sustainable development goals and embed them in all of their operations. So this isn't something that's just in a development area. Increasingly, this is kind of core business for all, for all engineering work. Sunny Foresight, so he, co or he founded Abundant Water, working on those ceramic water filters in, in Laos. Um, so we've had a number of research projects with them over probably 10 years. Um, Becky uh, was one of our first students who went on a design summit in 2015 um, and was one of our first students to do the Engineering for Humanitarian Context course, um, which is the longest running course of its type in Australia. So we first launched that pro uh, that course in 2015 and it was the first course focusing on humanitarian engineering in Australia um, and we've run that basically every summer and winter since. When she graduated Becky then went on she did a research project with EWB in Cambodia and then when she graduated she actually went on into 12 month volunteer placement with EWB in Cambodia as well. Um, and then Afnan so he's actually co-founded an organization called Okra Solar who are making and installing small-scale microgrids for Cambodia. So when you've got household energy, being able to connect those into kind of village level networks so that you can distribute the energy and have a much greater capacity and robustness in your system. Um, and then now rolling that, rolling that technology out into a couple of other countries as well. So you can see that, you know, you're still building from those core engineering skills, but it's thinking about how we make sure that they're appropriate for the place that we're working and the people that we're working with as well. The really it's the kind of the, the bigger impact. It's about how do we use our engineering and technology to have a positive impact on human well-being for everybody, not just those who can afford it. And increasingly that's seen as, as, as a, what engineering does. So Engineers Australia is the peak professional body for engineers in Australia. They now view engineering as creating ha happy, healthy, sustainable and prosperous communities. So it's how do we work with communities to make them healthier and happier. In the US, the National Academy of Engineering, they have their grand challenges around sustainability, health, security, and joy of living. So, you know, again, how as engineers, how are we just making life more enjoyable? And the Royal Academy of Engineering based in the, U in the UK, at its heart, engineering is a creative activity that seeks to solve technical problems to improve well-being and tackle society's challenges. So this is now increasingly being seen as, as the role for engineering, particularly if we think about the challenges that we have for this century but also the opportunity we have from emerging technology. But really how is engineering playing its role along with all the other professions and disciplines to make sure that quality of life is as high as possible for everyone around the world. That's all we wanted to cover for this. Um, we might come back to this to talk about some of the other sessions uh, as well, but now I think we'll, we'll pause this and, and we might with Maka start working through some questions if there have been any that come through. Um, as well. We'll certainly invite any other questions that you've got. I just realised I have my phone. It's muted. <laughs> Typical. Um, so um, we haven't had, um, well, this is the right time to ask any questions. So if you have any questions, just pop them into the Q&A uh, box. But um, while we wait for some questions, I actually um, do have one question. I, I, I'm I would like to know how humanitarian engineer engineering uh, relates to systems engineering. So the one thing about ANU that is very different uh, and that really stands out from other universities is our systems engineering focus. So how does uh, humanitarian engineer uh, is inbuilt in that, into that concept or into that um, focus? I might have first go, but then I might invite Maddie and Tom as well, kind of how they've, how they found that. Um, so yeah, so systems engineering, uh, is about thinking 
about complex systems and, and systems made up of multiple subsystems and components. Thinking about that over an entire life cycle. It's not just design or operation, but then also end of life. And also being aware of social, cultural and environmental uh, and economic impacts and, and sustainability as well. So that gives a, an amazing foundation for humanitarian engineering. So it's one of the reasons that humanitarian engineering has certainly grown here at ANU compared to other universities, that within our systems engineering, we're already thinking a bit about life cycle, thinking about sustainability from different perspectives, thinking about our kind of human users and that, those elements as well. And so humanitarian engineering is, is almost a, an extra step for that. Um, and if you can apply those systems engineering principles for a humanitarian and a development context, where you're often resource constrained, you often have larger uh, social and cultural factors that you need to think about. The environmental sustainability can be more important. If you can do it in that space, then you will be able to apply it much more broadly into kind of a lot more other contexts as well. And in some ways it becomes easier. So humanitarian engineering almost is like a, an extreme version of that, I think. But they, they certainly build for some very similar tool sets as well and, and approaches and techniques. But if Maddie and Tom have listened. Yeah, they want yeah. To share I definitely um, have something to add, particularly going on one of the design summits and sort of learning, the, seeing the difference between how I had approached problems and identifying what the problem was and more importantly, what the solution would look like um, in comparison to a lot of uh, other students from other different universities that sort of had a slightly different um, engineering degree set up where they had just their sort of major as their um, degree. I found that I was able to see the bigger picture a lot and also um, sort of structurally outline what an appropriate solution would actually look like. So it was quite, it was a noticeable difference, um, particularly, and I was just using the skills that I'd been learning throughout my systems engineering degree. So it's definitely um, also on that, definitely something to look forward to after doing some of the foundation courses, because you'll find it's a much enriching, more enriching learning experience. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add there. I think you both summarised it really well. Uh, but I do think that, yeah, systems engineering and humanitarian engineering go hand in hand. And I think that's what really attracted me to humanitarian engineering was the fact that I would be able to use all of these very cross-disciplinary skills that I picked up in my systems degree. I think that's some feedback we often get from the design summit. So as Matty says, starting to work with other traditional disciplines, so with civil, electrical, mechanical, um, as a systems engineer, you need to think about how all those different aspects fit together within the actual context you're, you're, you're building for and the users you're building with as well. Um, and the other aspect of that is, um, you know, going on something like a design summit forces you to trust your tools. You know, it's a completely unknown environment. You know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know exactly what's going to merge. We can't create experiences like that on a campus. And so it forces you to kind of trust the tools and the process that you have to get you through those unknowns and that uncertainty as well. Thanks, Jeremy. We actually have one question um, and um, it was one of the questions that I wanted to ask as well. Um, what sort of employment opportunities or organizations could this course lead you to? And I think you've touched a little bit about um, with um, some of the stories, but um, yeah, if you have any other additional ones, just yes. Yeah, certainly. So we've, because this is so new, we're still finding that out in many respects. And so um, because some of the opportunities here at a and are a little bit longer than some other universities, and it's great to see plenty of opportunities around the country, um, we've been following our graduates a little bit more to see where they do end up. I think it's certainly safe to say that most of our graduates will still end up in traditional engineering roles or with engineering firms, but they're certainly seen as being more if you want a better word, employable, because they've got that broader skill set. Um, and when we think about modern engineering in a country like Australia, that ability to think through the requirements, why are we building this technology, who are we building it for, and increasingly thinking through the social and the environmental impacts um, are becoming increasingly important and isn't a traditional skill set that we've equipped many engineers with. So we often find that even if our graduates go to a, 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 a traditional engineering consulting firm or a construction firm or resources or, or energy, 
they're still bringing that kind of human dimension to their work. And that's usually what their employers are looking for is to not just focus on the technical design, but that technical design and the humans it's being designed for. Um, we have also, as you show, as, as we saw, we've had graduates and they're in the minority, but we certainly have had graduates who've gone on to volunteer with a number of international development organizations, um, work with, we've had a couple who've worked with indigenous communities here in Australia. Um, and then ones like Hoy and Sunny and Afnan who've actually set up their own not-for-profits or social enterprises as well. Um, and that's why those ones are really exciting for us because it gives us an opportunity to, to keep engaged with those alumni. So we've had projects with, with Sunny and with Hoy and with Afnan. Um, and that's a really great way of them getting some additional capacity from our students, but also students starting to understand those, those steps um, going forward. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely say just to sort of add from that question, and I know that Jeremy um, touched on it. I think that any experience with humanitarian engineering really enhances your employability. Um, so I think from an employer's perspective, a lot of the time they don't care like how many equations you've managed to memorize or how many algorithms you've like put through your computer. Like what a lot of employers are really interested in is like, what, how have you faced up to adversity? How have you demonstrated resilience? How do you work well in diverse teams solving ambiguous problems? I think those are some of the trickiest questions that a lot of people looking for jobs get asked. And from my perspective, at least, I've found those questions a lot easier to answer, drawing on my experiences with humanitarian engineering. Because um, I think in humanitarian, in humanitarian engineering, you're constantly having to sort of navigate through uncertainty, work with diverse teams, um, manage conflict, um, manage expectations. So I think it's been a huge boost in my own employability. And I'm sure that Maddie probably has a similar experience. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think, yeah, in terms of what the specific job will be at the end of um, your degree, I think immersing yourself in things that you're, you know, align, align with your values, align with how you want to challenge yourself and what you want to be a part of, you'll find that so many opportunities will pop up and you'll be easily able to, you know, adjust to them and rise to the occasion because of, you know, the constraints and the limits that you've learnt to work under and know how to succeed under. Thanks, Mali. Um, I actually have another question. Uh, I think this was probably for Jeremy. Um, are there more experiences, and um, for Thomas, because he also did the R&D, are there more experience available for humanitarian engineering in the R&D course? And if there's a significant difference between the two courses? Do you want to start, Tom? Yeah, I'm happy to answer. And if any of the, my advice is like out of date, feel free to just butt in. Um, so I think the main, like in terms of significant differences, I wouldn't say there's any major differences, but I think if you look at the significant differences between say the R and D stream of engineering and just the normal, like the, the general stream of engineering in the R and D stream as a student, you get um, access to do access to research at a much earlier stage. So all students, um, have the option to do a 12 unit, which is a, a year long or two semester research project at the end of their studies. But in the R&D stream, you get the opportunity to actually pursue longer and similar sort of intensive research projects in, in third year and also in second year. So if you are say an R&D student with a keen interest in humanitarian engineering, there is the opportunity to undertake sort of like more research in humanitarian engineering at an earlier stage of your degree. Um, Myself, yeah, I sort of took advantage of the research project in a humanitarian engineering sense uh, for my honours project. Um, so I, th I think that that would be my answer for the main difference between the two. Um, if we've had a couple of students, um, so as Tom says, in second year for R&D, you do a couple of semester long six unit research projects. And so we've had a couple of students where we've used uh, an overseas EWB design summit as part of that research project. So it's a, an opportunity to go to go on a summit um, and then come back with some ideas and explore those a little bit further with your research project. So the R&D possibly gives us a little bit more flexibility to kind of weave in some of the, whether it's international experiences or some of the kind of uh, community-based projects, just gives us a bit more flexibility of weaving those through your degree program. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I have a question for Madeline and Thomas. Um, I think as a, from a perspective of a student, um, what has been your biggest challenges like when doing your projects on humanitarian engineering? What has been some of the roadblocks or 
um, some of the um, yeah challenges that you've faced. I think that that that's for me as a student, I would find that really interesting to see how you've coped and what you've done. Um, in the would you like to start, Maddie? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I definitely can think of two that spring to mind. The first would be um, I started my research project with the cocoa bean project this year, and it's been quite a challenge you know lots of things have been affected by COVID but I think that in particular um, sort of my uh, you know having sort of virtual and remote contact with the person people that you're supposed to be sort of working with has been quite challenging so it's been really helpful to draw on my experiences from other design summits to sort of understand what potentially could be applicable in these situations and then seeing how they go and I think uh, the second thing that I've found to be a little bit difficult is sort of jumping straight to the most technical and uh, impressive solution. Um, especially in the design summit, I really found that a lot of other students wanted to, you know, design a really cool, you know, rice plower or, you know, uh, sorry, rice, you know, really, really cool designs. But honestly, sometimes the simplest solution is the most, uh, often the most simple solution is the most effective. So, you know, making sure that rather than going on a really awesome design tangent, you're really meeting the requirements of the user. That's definitely something that's challenging. Yeah, um, and I'd say from my perspective, like from my individual perspective with humanitarian engineering, I'd say some of the most challenging aspects of it have just been taking on a lot more responsibility within a research project. Um, I had experience earlier in my degree doing research projects like in what I would call like more traditional research where you're in a lab group most of your like data collection, your gathering of results happens in a lab and you sort of have like a research group around you to bounce ideas off and everyone is more or less working on the same topic. Um, with humanitarian engineering, there's like quite a lot more independence, I think, as a student and quite a lot more, I guess, decisions that need to be made by you uh, because a lot of the problems you're encountering or the problems you're trying to solve are problems that no one solved before. I think there's a lot more scope to sort of for say when I was doing my honors to sit down with Jeremy and for the two of us to kind of brainstorm, like what are, what are going to be our best strategies moving forward. Um, so I think there's quite a lot more autonomy you get in humanitarian engineering. Um, and with that autonomy, more responsibility to make decisions, which is it's rewarding, but it's also quite challenging. Thanks Thomas. And uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to add anything to it or. No, I was just going to kind of following on from, from what was Tom saying, um, you know, quite a, most of our final year projects will work with an external partner. Um, and the way we engage with those will vary from location, from the partner and these kinds of aspects as well. What we try and make sure we've done through experiences like the summits, the overseas summits or the humanitarian engineering for humanitarian context course is that you've got a, a good grounding and a good preparation for those um, as well. So we've kind of started from, you know, we want students to be able to have an impact through their research while they're in at university. We want that in their final year. So how do we kind of take the steps back to earlier years to kind of start to hopefully equip you and prepare you as, as much as possible for that um, as well. But as I say, the idea with those is many of them are, they're live projects. People are, you know, interested in the results. The results, we can see where they're going to feed in and where they're going to fit in with those organisations um, uh, ongoing work and quite often we've been asked to do the project because those partners couldn't do the project themselves so thinking through both Tom and Maddie's projects you know they're doing some some modeling of fluid dynamics and computer aided design modeling our partner in PNG just doesn't have those that software tools or that expertise available to them and they can do other things really well they can grow cocoa beans and collect cocoa beans and, and make things out of bits of pipe and stainless steel so how do we work with them in partnership and what's our skill set that we can bring and then how's that complementing their strengths as well? Um, so it's very much a kind of a collaborative team based approach as well. And you can see it definitely on the projects as well, um, how um, collaboration is just the key sort of focus on. And I have a, a, a bit of a personal question for you, Jeremy, because um, looking at your bio, you're more into, you, you started working in um, sort of more autumn, um, cars like um, just manufacturing so what made you interested in humanitarian engineering in the first place so I was very so I did my undergraduate degree at ANU as well I did a double degree in engineering and information technology and then was fortunate to get a position as a research assistant we had a very large collaborative research project 
looking in the automotive industry um, with some other universities and suppliers and particularly with the Ford, um, Ford Motor Company as well. Um, and we were doing a number of different research projects and I was looking at how do we take the outcomes from those research projects and feed them into Ford's operations. So when you do a research project like a PhD, you know, you do your research and you write it as a thesis, but that thesis isn't what then someone actually uses to make cars better. Um, so my role is to kind of support that, taking those research ideas and implementing them. Mm -hmm. um, so what we call technology diffusion. Um, and in doing that, we worked with, you know, Ford in Geelong and Melbourne and the US and UK and in parts of Europe and, and in, even in India. And the approach that we would need to take for each of those different countries or each of those different facilities would be different based on the culture of that particular manufacturing facility. And that might be based on its national location. It might be based on the backgrounds of the people who work there. And so it's only by understanding the organizational cultural context that we could actually do our technology transfer. Um, and so after a number of years of doing that, I realized that by comparison, the technology development was relatively straightforward. The more difficult bit was making sure the process to use it was adapted for whoever we were working with. Um, that was an interesting finding. EWB, Engineers Without Borders, started in Australia about the same time. I didn't, as an automotive manufacturer, engineer, I didn't think I'd have anything to contribute into international development, but I kind of went mm -hmm. along because it sounded nice. And about halfway through a conference, there was a presentation from someone who'd been installing solar cookers in Africa, in Malawi, and they were using exactly the same approaches and exactly the same research that we were using for automotive manufacturing. And I suddenly realized I was just looking at my engineering in the wrong way, that I actually need to look at those wherever you are, there's those human factors and that organization, that cultural side. And it's only by understanding that and working with those cultures that your engineering will actually be effective and used. And so that was kind of a, a real light bulb, kind of blew my mind moment. And then that gave me the, the, the ability to kind of think much more laterally about my engineering as well and kind of really remove some of the blinkers that I had. And you've really been like a pioneer in humanitarian engineering for ANU, you've really pushed it. so which is fantastic. Um, and As, what about... Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, from that point of view, you know, we've seen you know, interest over many years from students. Yes. So Hoy, Becky going back, Maddie and Tom now, but also the interest, so that's the kind of student side. But then as we've talked about that kind of, that uh, employer side and the skills are just more in demand. So it's, you know, if it, we didn't have both of those things, it wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And what about you, Maddie? What made you interested in humanitarian engineering? What, what was that light bulb moment for you? Um, I think I've always had an interest in sort of inclusion. I think it's never made any sense to me to design something or to look at a solution that only works for a small group of people. I think we've seen so many examples throughout the history of engineering um, and you know, uh, manufacturing where it's only worked for specific groups of people. And I just... I think that makes no sense. <laughs> um, and I think after doing the design summit and sort of uh, a few personal reasons for how I was um, brought up, I really found that that was something that would challenge me and would give me um, sort of fulfillment in terms of how I was applying my engineering skills. Um, so that was, I guess I'm still having a few of those light bulb moments and, you know, graduating at the end of this year is um, also looking to, for a way to continue to, have that fulfillment and yeah, have those challenging moments that I am able to navigate out of. <laughs> and what about you, Tom? Yeah, I think, I think Maddie put it really well at the end there. There's like, I probably had like a few light bulb moments during my degree, but I think I'm still continue, continuing to have those light bulb moments. Um, I think similar to Maddie, I was really, I've always been quite passionate about making some kind of impact. Like, so taking sort of the skills and the opportunities and I guess like the privilege that I've been able to, to like have growing up and try to translate that into positive impact to other people. Um, I think going into engineering, that probably wasn't at the forefront of why I chose to do engineering. I think I was just keen to get into the nitty gritty of maths and numbers and complex <laughs> systems. Um, and it definitely wasn't until the engineers without borders design summit that I went on where I had this sort of, I managed to, and I think Jeremy put it really well, like draw the connection between 
my skills and the work that other people were doing. And I think I saw the work that other people were doing and that looked like more interesting and more impactful work. And I saw my skills and thought, ah, like I think I can sort of fit myself in that, like sort of change lanes effectively. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I had that sort of preconceived idea that, oh, like I'm not a doctor, like I can't make a direct impact to people's health, but like as an engineer, like you can improve water and sanitation facilities or you can improve coca bean farming and thereby like allow more money to come back to smallholder farmers and then for those farmers to spend the money on better education and better healthcare. So it's sort of, it's sort of the ways you can make more of an, like, I don't know what the word is here, but like make less of an explicit impact and more of like a strong impact in more subtle ways, I think with engineering. So I think, yeah, I think I'm still continuing to have those light bulb moments, but still trying to sort mm -hmm. of make my future career and study decisions based on like where I can have that impact. Thanks, Tom. And on the topic of impact, Jeremy, which have, have been the projects that you've been more most proud of uh, in terms of impact? I know you do, I mean, there's, every year there's lots of different projects that you are working on. Um, so, yeah, just curious to know which ones have been the ones that you're most proud of. Uh, I mean, personally, the, the ones that I'm most proud of are actually around the education that we've been putting together. So to work on one project that might have an outcome, you know, such as one of our abundant water projects where we've been able to demonstrate, uh, you know, a more, res more robust water filter that's going to have, you know, benefit to the, you know, a couple of thousand people who might buy those filters is, is great. But it's still one project. Um, so the education side is particularly in of interest to me. So how do we construct a broader education environment that then is going to have lots of people coming out to make change in lots of different areas. And it's that broad impact that we need to have. So we don't need engineers to just go and work in, in Lao on water filtration. We need engineers in Australia to kind of advocate. And I think, as Tom said, demonstrate leadership as well and point out that as an engineering profession, the technologies and the engineering we design have a global impact now. There's, there's no two ways about it. And so it's not just the kind of the end user aspect of it. How are we trying to shape policy, how are we trying to shape practice, how are we having, you know, in all of the organisations we work with, point out that all of our engineering needs to be focused around those kind of human impacts. Uh, we can't ignore environmental impacts, we can't ignore negative social impact, we can't design just for, as Maddie said, one type of person, you know, we can't limit our benefits to just one demographic. So I think the, the kind of the education system that we've managed to put together and now watching where our graduates are going and you know, some are championing work overseas and some are championing work in Australia and some in consultants. And it's collectively that kind of voice as that gets bigger and louder will have a, a much bigger impact on the engineering profession as a whole, which is what we really need when we think about the challenges that we're facing this century. Thanks, uh, Jamie. That's a really good. Uh, that's a really good comment. And also, I think it, one of the things that I find really interesting about humanitarian engineering is how it, it's how interdisciplinary it is. So it's just not just systems engineers, not just engineering. You actually have to have a, a connection with um, policy. Um, so you not just work within the college. You actually collaborate. There's a lot of collaboration within colleges and other universities as well to achieve the, that kind of impact. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that as well, what collaboration with other schools. So we've, for the last couple of years, we've had a couple of projects on campus. So we had a project last year where we worked with the Fenner School of Environment and also actually the, the School of Culture, History and Language. Um, and some of the academics in there had worked on or been working on uh, it was hydrology in Indonesia um, and looking at water flows. It was an area where there'd been um, alluvial gold mining. So there was a gold rush that ran for about 10 years and all the rice farmers became gold farmers, uh, sorry, gold miners. And <laughs> gold. The gold ran out. They went back to being farmers, but they left a lot of the pollution and the contaminants that go with gold mining. So particularly mercury. So this has now started to leach out and is getting into the water supply and then into the rice paddies and, and fish as well. Um, and so we knew an academic from another university who developed this really novel polymer based on 
sulfur, which is a waste product from the petroleum industry, and waste cooking oil, waste vegetable oil, that when you combine it appropriately is absorbent to mercury, but not necessarily other things. And so we were looking at how could you use this material to then start to absorb mercury out of that environment before it starts to get into the water supply. So that needed to understand the hydrology aspect of it and how the water flows. It needed to understand the mercury contamination. Um, and so that's why the academic from the School of Culture, History and Language had the best mercury analyzer in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Um, wow. so we were working with her. And then our engineering students were bringing the materials and the manufacturing side of it. But it's only understanding all those different aspects that we can start to approach a complex problem like that. Um, so that was one example just from last year that we're still working on and kind of looking at some of the results that have come out from that. Um, increasingly working with other universities as well around Australia. Um, and as you said, so much of this is around collaboration. You know, the, the, the challenges are, are big and complex. Um, and the relationships and the partnerships that are required to approach them as well um, need, to be, need to be solid. So uh, working with other universities, other organisations, um, to each bring our own individual skill set and our own strengths and also recognizing where your limitations are so you know we're good at doing certain things not other things so how do we find someone who's good at that part so that the work we're doing overall is as is, is impactful as possible and i would imagine that at those design summits you would actually get the opportunity to actually meet those people from different universities who are doing similar things so you can collaborate together um, so that that sounds amazing to me um so that's one of the other to find your community basically and it's what we've been we've been leading here at the anu as well is how do we how do we work at a national level around this as well so if we're thinking about that impact on the engineering profession that has to have multiple universities so we help to establish a national network of humanitarian engineering around australia we've been working now with engineers australia who's the peak professional body um, and looking at how do we actually define the practice of humanitarian engineering to make sure it's done in the most appropriate and quality ways. Um, so we're working with communities, we're often working with vulnerable individuals that has the highest levels of kind of ethical responsibility that goes with it. So how do we make sure we're preparing students for that as well? So increasingly we've been leading those national discussions as well, which you know is probably part of our role as the national university. Um, and then increasingly starting to have those with other countries as well. Yeah, that's very true. And a good place to start actually is outreach. So like, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, we do a lot of outreach uh, with Engineers Without Borders. And um, actually students on their first year or second year, they actually get exposed to actually do um, a lot of these um, to actually perform and do all of these workshops. So they actually get like a first sort of opportunity to um, get those skills. So Maddie, Thomas, did you participate in EWB at some point in doing some outreach? Um, I actually never got uh, involved in the EWB outreach. Um, I sort of did the design summit and then went straight into uh, a research project in humanitarian engineering. So yeah, unfortunately I didn't actually have that experience myself. Yeah, I wasn't a part of the specific outreach. I definitely attended a few events. Um, I think I had a lot of, put a lot of energy into um, 5050, which is a sort of um, organization promoting gender equity in STEM, which is another thing you can get a part of just doing my, you know, obligatory plug. <laughs> and on that, actually, on that, that topic, um, it's a, actually a good opportunity to actually mention that on Friday at 2.30, <laughs> we actually have a panel, a student panel with the different uh, organizations uh, that um, are here meant at the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And we will have representatives from 5050 uh, uh, from Rocketry, uh, engineers without borders um, and robo gals so you actually also get an opportunity to talk to them um, so that's fantastic um, so I'm just I think we've reached the time so I just want to thank uh, Jeremy Maddie and Thomas for joining us today um, and again if you have any questions or if you want to talk to Jeremy um, you can just send us an email at marketing.kex at anu.edu.au and we would happily um, answer any questions you might have about um, humanitarian engineering and I invite you to look at the program that we have. We still have three days left of virtual open day events and there's uh, quite a big, 
big, big lineup of events. And actually on Friday, there's, oh, Jeremy is showing now the, the, uh, the timetable. So if you're interested in engineering, I would definitely uh, recommend coming on Friday uh, to talk to Professor Kylie Catchpole and Associate Professor uh, Sean Zhu to talk. Uh, we'll have a, a session on um, just engineering, basically, and a student panel. And actually, uh, at the end of five to six, we're going to have the 30 years of engineering ANU panel. So uh, plenty of opportunities to engage with us uh, and get your questions answered. Um, so thank you very much uh, uh, to everybody. And I hope you have a lovely afternoon. And um, if you have, again, any questions, just let us know. So thank you. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.